Good afternoon, everyone. It is 3 p.m. 3 p.m. in the beautiful country of the Netherlands. I can't wait to start traveling again. But what is the best way to spend a Monday afternoon? To bring together all our friends in laser optics and talk to us about challenges and end user needs. George Fisher is in the room. I'm going to come to you. I want to know all your needs in laser optics and do business. Let's be epic on this beautiful, on this beautiful Monday afternoon. So what challenges lie ahead for Laser Optics? We have organized many successful business meetings to ask the end user this very question. What is the ideal beam shape you need out of your laser systems? And we heard perfect lines, perfect gaussians, perfect donuts, perfect top hats. They all use the same phrase perfect bean shape. Well, I have bad news. Perfection does not exist in Mother Nature. But we do have extremely high-spec epic laser optics, which are approaching perfect. They are suitable for high fluence, meaning high power in a small surface, or suitable for high repetition rates or ultra-short pulses. From my position as a technology observer, I have witnessed huge investments by optics manufacturers in new equipment. Companies like WZW, Altecna, Optoman, 3Photon, Exma Optics, they all have invested heavily in new ion beam sputtering machines. And my question was, why? And their answer is, the laser optics market is skyrocketing at this moment. We want to be part of the boom. Ion beam sputtering enables optics with the necessary spectral dispersion and high laser damage thresholds for today's advanced femtosecond lasers. As we've seen previously, femtosecond laser demands in industrial manufacturing have never been greater. At the same time, the high kilowatt laser industry for high welding applications is also gaining traction. The demand is there for high welding speed, narrow and slim weld shape, and low thermal distortion. For example, LaserLine has revolutionized so-called gas-shielded metal arc welding. But what's next for LaserLine and how can we help them? They are a high-power blue diode laser specialist. As they move to higher power, 5 kilowatts and beyond, what new beam shaping challenges are on the horizon? And equally important as beam shaping, we should discuss beam splitting. Trump and IPG have already briefed us. Most of the clients of the laser system integrators are demanding higher throughput. The best way to achieve it is to go to a multi-beam solution with diffractive optical elements. Let's ask semiconductor giant Infineon about their needs for throughput in the semiconductor industry and then match it with the systems of Inolas, NTS or LASEA right down to diffractive optical elements of hollow or power photonic or Incron. Wow, that's going to be awesome! So if you are a laser optics manufacturer, a coating developer, a beam shaping expert, a laser manufacturer or a system integrator, or you simply want to invest in one of Europe's most successful photonic fields, it is time for action. Sign up right now to join your epic Zoom room on April 12th. Or you can always catch up later in our on-demand YouTube channel. Once again, it is time to focus on laser optics. It is time to focus on laser optics. And I hope all of you drank a lot of coffee on this Monday afternoon. I did. I did. And I am fully energized to make sure that we did, today we do a lot of business. Yes, Lidaris, you're going to help us test all the optics here and see if the laser-induced damage threshold that they promise is what they delivered. We're going to come to you. But first, I would like to say thank you very much to all of you. There's going to be a big announcement on the amount of members reached on the annual general meeting in today, so I'm not going to give any spoilers, but I am so happy 
that we keep growing because of the support, the, the feedback and all the energies that the epic industry, that the photonic industry in Europe is giving to us. Thank you so much. I'm here talking on behalf of a fantastic team. I always say this, but I can never get tired of saying it. A fantastic team of people. We dedicate our lives to the photonic industry. All we do is very simple. We organize events. We are not an event organizer. We provide you access to our network, and that's the most important. We can introduce you to anyone that you want to talk to. We help you raise capital. We have the biggest website to find a job in photonics, jobsinphotonics.com. Visit it. There's new opportunities there. I, we added them last week, and we give market data to all our members. We buy market reports. We give them to you for free because you deserve it. Also, we got to say that today is a big day. It's the first chapter of the season four. This is like a Netflix show. The season four, chapter one of the online technology meetings. Today we talk laser optics. We have announced all the events there all the way to summer. And then we go on holidays, of course. So you're interested in topics like microscopy, laser cutting, laser micromachining, molded optics. And I know you are. Sign up online ASAP. Please sign up as soon as possible to make our life much easier. And also, I would like to remind you that for the first time in 2021, we are also helping with the quantum industry. And that's particularly exciting for me. The next chapter, the final chapter of first quantum technology meeting series, finishing on the 23rd of April. That's really around the corner. We are going to bring the entire supply chain together to address quantum opportunities. But today, Today's laser optics. And first of all, I would like to acknowledge the amazing support of our media partner, Photonics Views. Thank you so much for helping us reach the industry. You're doing a fantastic job. But also, we'd like to acknowledge the support of these people. Without them, this meeting wouldn't be possible. Our sponsors today. First, we go to Lithuania and we talk to three. Photon, crystal and coating provider. You're looking for LBO, BBO, FS, dichroic mirrors. You're looking for optical components. You're looking for applying IBS comfort coating to almost any substrate. These are the people who promise you fast delivery. But if you're looking for a specialized laser crystal, you're looking for some laser-based services all the way to polishing, if you're looking for laser optics manufacturing, you have to go to Exma Optics. They are the supplier of high-end customized optics solution for the laser industry. If you're looking to talk to the people who know the best about IBMs, about ion being sputtering technology, you go to OptoMan and they will help you. These are the people who specialize in providing IBS coating for the optics, for the laser optic industry of the world. If you're looking for an entry point into the Swiss industry, you're looking to talk to the people in the Rhine Valley, Rhine Valley Research and Innovation Center in Switzerland is called RISEARCH. They're an epic member to help all the companies providing optics, coatings, or laser technology to add, address and access the Swiss market. If you want a partner on metrology solutions, on metrology solutions for UV, UV visible and mid-wide infrared, your partner is called Ascent Optics. They provide solutions that go from the 185 nanometers all the way to the 5.2 micrometers. But if you're looking for a company to help you measuring the laser-induced damage threshold, there's a partner for you all the way. Lithuania, they are called Lidaris and they are fantastic. If you're looking for black coatings, if you're looking for high absorption coatings, your partner is called Actar Advanced Coatings. They provide the black coatings who have the highest level of absorption with high reliability and suitable to ultra high powers. And finally, everybody knows our last sponsor today, Edmund Optics. If you are in optics and you don't know Edmund Optics, we are perhaps doing your, the, the wrong job because Edmund Optics is really a market leader when it comes to specializing manufacturing lasers, optics for ultra fast lasers, all the way to metrology solutions. Thank you so much, Edmund Optics, and all the sponsors today on this fantastic meeting. And thank you very much, Grace Mille, Dr. Francesca Moglia, who is the person who worked the hardest on making sure that the right people are in the room today. Francesca Francesca, che cosa mangiamo? Thanks a lot, Jose, for the introduction. So today to eat, so coatings are not good to eat, but yeah, optics maybe, yes, they're a bit more consistent. <laughs> but now the idea is to talk today about the challenges of laser optics. We don't eat them, we don't bite them, and this is the order of the speakers we have today, but it's just a bit boring list. So the one that we really like to show you is this one. So this is presenting all the people that are in the room, or this they sign up to be here today to discuss all the challenges that laser optics can have. So as you see here, 
here we have a few sectors. We have, of course, in the middle laser optics, like, like is everything rotating around this sector in the middle? But then, of course, we need the end user and integrators for different applications that we will for sure ask what is your challenge and we will try to face it. So end user and system integrators are a bit both the, our reference today to ask for challenges. Of course, the lasers, because the laser manufacturers, of course, have to be involved and have to tell us what are the challenges they have when their laser is are on action. And then, of course, coating and filters. Today, coating people have to be pay a lot of attention and also tell us what is their issues and how they want to fix the issues of, the, of the, all the end users of optics. And then, as you see, testing and metrology, very important. Equipment, R&D, because let's not forget the future of the technology is in the R&D and uh, center's hands. And so with this, I give back the word to Jose and to our fantastic speakers and people today. Grazie mille, Francesca. Let me just remind that this slide corresponds to the companies who registered for the meeting today. You're an Epic member, right? You missed your logo here. That only means that you forgot to register. Don't let it happen again. Register for the upcoming meetings. It's all in the website. And also, let me remind everyone that this meeting is also live streamed in YouTube. So hello, YouTubers of the world. Welcome to the show. If you want to get in touch with any of the participants today, just yes, drop me an email and I will make sure I make the introduction. If you have any question during the meeting, please write that, write that in the chat. I will read it in the room. This is, of course, also valid here for me, for the people in the Zoom room, we have an internal chat. Use it. Use it a lot constantly. Just make sure that you get in touch with each and one of you to make sure you do business. And also, if after the meeting you still want to get in touch with any of the participants, drop me an email and I will make sure I make the introduction. But as you saw in the opening video, we have this agenda and we have really the idea that there is a company who is making a difference on the high-end laser-based manufacturing. In the previous meetings, you have seen presentations from LaserLine, from Marcus Rutering, about how they are revolutionizing the industry of laser-based manufacturing. We were excited, amazed, but we want to help. So for us, it was really important to bring back Marcus today to make sure that we ask him the epic question on laser optics. What can you do for our laser optics manufacturers and what can they do for you? Marcus Rutering from LaserLine. It is an honor and a pleasure that you took the chance today to opening on Laser Optics Online Technology Meeting. The floor and the attention of everyone goes to LaserLine, goes to you. Oh, Jose, how can I cope with this introduction? <laughs> so thanks a lot for, for having me. Uh, thanks, Francesca, for, for putting me on the agenda. Um, and also Antonio to constantly be in touch uh, and discuss what's going on and what we can do. Um, do you see my presenting screen? Crystal right clear. Okay. Um, yeah, thanks again for having me. As, as, uh, as I mentioned, uh, challenges in optics was the topic and um, I understand the presentation should be short. And you know what? I prepared one slide, but I hope still it has a lot of content that we can discuss about. Uh, so let's jump forward um, here. So this is my one slide. And uh, um, what I'm looking at is basically the product portfolio that LaserLine offers at the moment. And let me try to develop some of the challenges out of this product portfolio that we have and some of the stuff that we would like to do and that we are looking forward to. So first of all, let me point out, uh, there's a typo, sorry, it's 1100 nanometers here. So we are doing lasers up to 45 kilowatts IR at the moment, 900 to 1100 nanometers. And we do blue lasers now up to two kilowatts of power at 445 nanometers. And our optics that we want to use with these powers and these wavelengths are very often transmittive. And I'm looking for transmittive optics, glassware, coatings, mirrors, or whatever that can handle these powers, just to put one basic challenge out. I mean, we are very good in doing the stuff with up to 10 kilowatts. We are doing transmittive optics up to 20 kilowatts. But if we are talking 45 kilowatts, and we even build a prototype of 60 kilowatts yet, um, it's a much more challenging um, to have this convert uh, to have these transmittive optics. And then blue is something which is rather new. We have hit two kilowatts. We are working on double the power in the future. And uh, here the coatings for mirrors and lenses and something is, is interesting. Another challenge is what we do in terms of hybrid lasers. So we are 
combining different types of lasers. Here is an example. This is a diode laser combined with a fiber laser. And you are getting in one spot such a beam shaping where you have the center beam creating a keyhole and the surrounding power that is creating um, a calm down of the, of the melt pool. Yeah? We do this with IR, IR combinations, fiber lasers with diode lasers. Um, from laser line, but we also do this now with IR and blue. So we have the infrared hotspot in the center and we have the blue diode laser surrounding. So we look at optics which are capable to handle both of the wavelengths, 445 nanometers and 900 to 1100 nanometers in general. We found some solutions. We have delivered such lasers, but I don't think that we are yet at the right position to have this at a reasonable pricing. So to come back to the first epic question, what can others do for us? We need these things in a shorter delivery time and a better price just to put one of these points out here. So if we move on, processing optics, we manufacture our own optics, of course, the glassware we buy. Yeah. So we have optics here which do homogenization. So we are creating different spot sizes. We're making round spots, square spots. We are making lines. We are making rectangles. We are making squares. And even other stuff, we are shaping beams into rings. We are shaping beams into um, something special for customers sometimes. And all of these optics are transmittive. We have here inside this unit typically homogenizing and beam shaping optics. And all of those also have to handle the transparent power, or have to be transparent for the power and can handle the power itself. Um, we also have developed beam shaping technologies where we can have the power here in the front spots, in the main spot, or nothing in the in the front spots anymore. Multi-spot applications, we do spot and spot applications. So we have beam shaping actually uh, qualified up to 10 kilowatts, but we have the high powered lasers. So there is something we have to move forward into. Um, another point is, I think, very important, and I know there are the right people here in the talk and that they come back to it, but we need sensing and monitoring. So in the past, optics were just simple components, a collimation lens, a focusing lens attached to a fiber optic. We create a focus and we do some welding. But this is no longer what we can do in the future. We need to know the result of our stuff. We need to know, is my optic in good shape? Is my cover slide in a good shape? Do I have power losses? What's the temperature of the cooling water to make sure my optics is fine? And then even forward is my part that I'm creating, that my, my laser is applicating. Is it correct? And can it go into a car? Can it go into an airplane? Is it a good product and such? So the combination of sensing and monitoring in the optics is a very important point. And um, I'm pretty sure I haven't looked honestly, but that there is also some friends from people who are in the range of, of uh, monitoring and sensing uh, also here in this call. We have more and more scanners going into laser technology. I mean, when I started lasers 30 years ago, scanners was something only used for marking systems, but now scanners are everywhere. Uh, if it's powder bed application, if it's applications for remote welding, if it's applications to jump from one to the other spot very quickly. And what you can see here in the scanner, I put a picture or rendering where it's a blue radiation over the scanner. So I have to be capable of doing the coatings and the F-theta lenses for my blue lasers now. And specifically F-theta for blue, whew, that was difficult to find some solutions here, which are, which are still um, possible to pay for. It was too long in delivery and too expensive, but this is something that's moving forward. Blue lasers have a lot to do with copper processing, EV, electrical vehicles, or e-mobility. There will be more and more pressure. Yeah, and last but not least, um, we are looking at optics which can create really big spots. We want to treat areas of, let's say, 500 by 500 millimeters. We want to make sure that these areas are homogeneous, that we have a nice heating of these areas. And today, if we go into these things with classic optics, we definitely have too long working distances, too long focal lenses. So diffractive optics, and which was mentioned already in the opener in the trailer, is, is a point which could be interesting. So solutions for this is something which we also look at. And all of the mixture is something that Laserline requires for, for different things, high power, transparent, different wavelengths, beam forming, and all of these. So one slide, but I hope still it was enough information to kick off a possible discussion. Thanks for, for your attention. 
Wow, yeah, that definitely, Marcus, that was a very intense one slide. <laughs> I, will, I will definitely tell all the people that usually tell me, how, how can I put in three slides everything that you could put a lot of information in one, and this is ex exactly what we want to hear. So you really pointed out all the challenges for all the main, uh, let's say, products that you that you have and that you the challenges that you have. So thanks a lot for this. So the, we have a couple of questions already in the, in the chat. So I maybe start with them, uh, but please, all the coated and optics manufacturers that they have to have an answer can also raise a hand. So the first is Alexander from Actar. Please, Alex, you can uh, ask the question yourself. Yeah, thank you very much. Thank you, Marcus, for the perfect short presentation. Um, I uh, listened and uh, heard you're doing a lot with uh, transmittive optics. Um, we do the exact opposite. So we do absorbing coatings, uh, very stable absorbing coatings. Uh, and I'm wondering if you assemble these uh, transmittive optics to optomechanical elements, is a scattered laser light a topic to you? Maybe also in combination uh, with uh, measurement systems and also is beam dumping and beam absorbing apertures a topic uh, for you that can solve uh, uh, can be solved with uh, absorbing coatings. Uh, let's start from the back. Uh, beam dumping is something, honestly, we try to avoid. Yeah, I mean, we are creating laser power straight from our diodes. And so um, the diode powers, the, phot the photons that we are creating are following 100% the current we put through the diode. So we rather switch off the power supplies. There was a time when uh, laser diodes didn't like to be switched on and off so much and where they were suffering from the, uh, from the change of the heat in the semiconductors, but this is no longer a big issue. So we rather switch off power supplies than dumping the beam, honestly. Um, um, it's also not the most efficient way to do it. Um, scattering, of course, is, is sometimes an issue, um, but not in the way um, that it's created. It's, um, it's in the way that how do I get my, my beam efficiently to the workpiece? So scattered light inside the optics is not a major point uh, because these optics are water-cooled. Of course, sometimes um, as you bring it up, we could be thinking about having a coating to absorb scattered lights at a preferred position. Yeah, something as far as I know, we haven't looked at. Um, but yeah, sometimes if you consider a 30 kilowatt laser and you lose 2% inside the optics, it's 600 watts, which is for many people more than the laser can produce. So um, it has a certain impact, correct? Um, absorbing it at a preferred position is something I personally haven't looked at, uh, but this is possibly a point that could be interesting. Maybe uh, one, one thing that I forgot to mention earlier, there's of course a hell of a lot of optics inside the laser. So I'm only talking about the laser power delivered to the workpiece. So I talked about processing optics more or less after the fiber. We could have talked about the beam delivery itself and we could have talked about a lot of optics inside the laser for beam forming the beam from the semiconductors into the fiber. But this is not my major topic. It's more for our R&D engineers. So I don't want to touch base on that. But of course, there is even more stuff that could be discussed, right? But uh, coming back, uh, Alexander, I hope it was possible to answer your question in principle. Perfect. Thank you. I need to talk to the R&D engineers. That's it. Why not? <laughs> Please, Marcus. <laughs> yeah, why, why not? I mean, uh, we can open this, this field of communication. Yeah, We want to make our optics that we, we offer to the customers better uh, every day. And um, the cooling of the optics and get rid of scattered beam and get rid of absorbed power is always an option. It's always a point. Yeah? We have to work on that. Very good, Marcus. We want to open a lot of channels today. So <laughs> be aware there will be a lot of channels opening. So thanks a lot also, Alexander, for the question. Now it's time for Nathan. Nathan, you have also a question, right? Yes, thank you, Francesca. So thank you for this interesting presentation. Uh, you said something at the end about large areas of 500 by 500 millimeters. Uh, and you said that the angles of diffractives are not reasonable and you need other solutions. Can you mention the work distances involved? So we know what to go through. Look, these, these applications, um, I mean, 500 in square is, is a bit forward looking. No, no customers ask that yet. 300 squared, we already delivered. 
Yeah? So it's not that far off. Um, it's typically applications in the area of heat treatment, of uh, warpage reduction or something like this. And this tells you it's possibly in the field of semiconductors. I don't think I can go any further, but um, these are the points. And if we talk about semiconductor, we talk about clean rooms. If we talk about clean rooms, first, the footprint is important. Second, there is a certain limit in height. You can't transport machines into these areas. Uh, I can't have a working distance of one meter 50 or something like this because you can't transport it through the doors into the clean rooms. So um, what I typically hear is that a working distance of 500 maximum 700 millimeters is the total limit. Nothing can go above that. And if I take a classic uh, fiber optic delivery and want to do a beam forming into a 500 squared spot, classic, then my working distance would be, well, I don't know, 1.5 to two meters. And this is unacceptable. So if we can stay below 500 millimeters working distance, that would be fantastic. And refractive options are fine for you, right? Like my randomized micro lens arrays or stuff like that. It's a multi-mode laser, I assume. It's multi-mode lasers anyway, right? We are we are having uh, typically beam parameter products entering from the fiber into the optics in the range of 30 to 100 millimeter milliradians. Can be better, um, depends on the application. But if I wanna make a 500 squared spot or 300 or whatever, why should I go with a single mode laser? That's that's not reasonable. Yeah? So it's it's a rather poor beam quality. Uh, actually, good for homogenization. That's correct. <laughs> uh, so okay, so I think we can follow up later on that, but we may have something. Thank you. Thanks a lot. Thanks a lot. This all sounds very also collaborative <laughs> now. So I don't see anybody raising their hands. You know, today we will be merciless. So I can pick you up by name. So come on, coatings, uh, optics, someone that can say, OK, we have these optics with blue and IR already. Ah, there I see. <laughs> so let's start with Remigius who raised his hand first, at least from my, see, from my side, please. <laughs> Uh, hello, I am Remigius from Optiman. Uh, uh, Marcus, it was extremely interesting presentation. Thanks for lo uh, thanks a lot for that. Very many topics to be covered there, <laughs> and I love that uh, uh, there are some good challenges. Uh, you mentioned the problems about scattering and uh, probably degradation of the coatings and uh, all that stuff. I was curious, how well did you, uh, how deep did you go into characterization of the coatings you use for uh, the blue applications? I mean, did you explore uh, the total scattering loss, damage threshold, probably in, in continuous wave regime, absorption uh, loss, and, and et cetera? Uh, do you have any, anything there or it has to be done from the very beginning? There had been stuff done, but I don't have the numbers in my hand because this is not my, my typical uh, um, center of gravity that I'm working on. Um, I mean, we have, let's say two kilowatt um, coming out of a 600 micron fiber. So this is the highest energy density in the whole system and the whole setup and the, all the optical components stand should be withstanding something like that. Um, of course, on the collimation lenses, there's smallest, uh, um, there's bigger spots. On the mirrors of the scanners, there's bigger spots. But um, consider that we want to bring the blue lasers in the range of four and five kilowatt in the future. Uh, so this is something where we have to deal with um, the exact numbers. Um, I can't tell you out of my head at the moment, but we can discuss about this also later on, maybe with, uh, with an optic expert from the company. Okay, thank you. And uh, another question. I believe you work with the classical few silica solutions or um, a little bit more fancy materials like crystalline uh, substrates for transmittive optics, sapphire, something more fancy than few silica? At, as far as I know, it's few silica, yes. Okay, understood. Thank you very much. Very good. Thanks a lot. Now, now I see Laurent. Exactly. He has also a, a, the raised his hand, right, from CEA. Is it correct? <laughs> you are muted. If you have a, a slip of the of the of raising hand. <laughs> okay, if it's not the case, because maybe it was a, a mistake, we have also Kyle. So Kyle, you from two six, you wrote in the chat, but please uh, ask your question. Sure. Um, so Marcus, you you've noted that there's water cooling going to uh, many of your heads. 
Um, do you currently have a guideline for what power level that becomes necessary? Or is it a function of how dirty the process is and how close the uh, optics are to the process? Or what's your take there? Um, the dirtiness of the, of the process, I would not take into considerations, to be honest. I mean, if the process is really dirty for this, we have a cover slide uh, typically down in the optics. Um, so let me just jump back to, to the screen. I hope you can see it again. So here we have cover slides uh, being attached to it. We have a cover slide here. Um, even if we go to a process which is rather dirty, uh, I mean, the cladding process here uh, with a white nozzle, there's a cover slide inside, uh, sorry, upside here, as close as possible to the focusing lens as far away. So this is something that has to take the dirt from the process. Um, of course, the cover slide, we normally water cool all the time. But if we get optics, let's say 500 watt laser, and it's a, a, an easy process where we have not a lot of scattering or absorption, not too many optical elements inside the optics head, we would rather not cool it with water. But if I go for something like three or four kilowatts of power and I have a collimation lens, I maybe have an homogenizer, I have a focusing lens, I may uh, possibly have a mirror to outcouple the camera signal or pyrometer signal, a focusing lens, maybe another beam bender. So so the amount of optical surfaces and components possibly would tell me that it's good to go ahead. We have two kilowatt systems in the market which are not water-cooled. We have 1,000 watt systems which are water-cooled. So somewhere in between, um, it's the point where you should start it. But if it's three, four, five kilowatt and above, I, I don't see that for some applications where you use such optical transmittive components, you, you would go without. I can't see it. Thank you, excellent answer. I have a question as well. I, 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 love, I love the presentations from Laser Light. Marcus, you are, you are a hero. Thank you so much for coming here with a shopping list. You talk about blue laser diodes, and that was fantastic. And you talked to us about the, the, the two kilowatts. I heard, uh, I think it's actually public, that you are working into going into, into higher, higher output powers. Uh, I have a lot of companies in Epic developing high-end micro optics. Do you think that going to high power in the blue laser diodes will actually bring new challenges and new opportunities for the, for the micro optics, laser uh, optics uh, suppliers? Um, sorry to answer with the question back. Um, do you see the micro optics in the field of manufacturing the laser source and putting the power into the fiber? Or do you see us talk about micro optics on the processing side? For me, I do see the micro optics being, uh, being done in the fab. Actually, the acquisition of Limo by Focus Light told me that this is really a trend that is going to be considered. I do, of course, would like to, to know more from you and maybe later from Convergent, who is also in the room, what is their vision on that? But my dream and my vision is that it will be done at the fab. Uh, yeah, inside the lasers, we use optics as well. <laughs> Let me, let me state it like this. And, and these optics are really important to do what we do. Um, first of all, I don't want to take it any further if you can accept it. <laughs> Second, I'm not the top specialist on these things. Um, I mean, I have a little bit of an inside view to what we are doing. But um, yeah, as I mentioned, these optics inside the laser is a different story. Um, and there is definitely something where the blue laser is also very challenging. Um, let's consider the following. If I look at a laser, let's say four kilowatt of power infrared, I, ex I use one wavelength today yeah, because the output power is higher per wavelength um, and I can couple several wavelengths. In blue, I have actually one wavelength, which is 445 nanometers and there is no wavelength coupling. So driving the power to a higher uh, levels uh, needs to be um, achieved by slightly different approaches because wavelength coupling is not necessarily an easy way to move. Now, if we get more blue lasers uh, which have different wavelengths and we can wavelengths couple them if they're not too close, that will boost the whole uh, stuff as well. Yeah. I think that's, that's good enough because I saw a few people in the room who are smiling with that answer. And that's what I wanted to see. There are opportunities for collaborating. I would like to see if uh, there is a, a maybe similar vision from Convergent. We also have Convergent in the room all the way from beautiful Torino. Uh, and let me, let me call for him, Andrea Agliati. Are you with us? 
Yes, hi. And, Andrea, you, Converging is one of these companies who we love in the laser diode business. I went to visit your facilities and I was amazed, <laughs> amazed by the, by the packaging of the laser diodes. Uh, when it comes to the optics and micro optics for the community, uh, what kind of opportunities and challenges does the laser diode business bring? Most of the time is related to the high power density and uh, the, the purity of the material that sometimes introduce some challenges in the uh, ferrule uh, of the uh, injected beams and the uh, micro optics where uh, all the diodes is converging in one beam spot into the fiber. So uh, most of the time uh, is difficult to give uh, a specific number in order to obtain the high purity material as well as the coating are the most important part of the micro optics. And uh, the challenge in order to have uh, for different powers, for different diet configuration, um, any kind of uh, micro optics you need in order to get the beam shaping done uh, is uh, the, the most important part of the uh, R&D and engineering process uh, to get a very reliable components. Andrea, we prepared with a lot of introductions after this meeting because of that particular, <laughs> that particular challenge. Francesca, back to you. Thanks a lot. Thanks a lot for the nice contribution so far. So now it's time for Rene. Rene had a question in the, in the chat. So please, and then we maybe go on. Let's see. But if you have questions, please raise your hands. We won't forget any of you. <laughs> OK, uh, yeah. Thank you, Marcos, for the nice presentation. Um, I was wondering, um, so you have very high uh, CW powers. And there is not really a standard, an ISO standard to measure the damage uh, threshold for, for those. Do you do the, such, such tests with your equipment for this high uh, um, C, uh, CW powers or do you have external partners or how, how do you do it? Basically, we do this internally. Um, so we find out uh, what is our necessities, what is our requirements, where we can go. And then um, also the, the R&D department communicates some numbers to us in sales that we know what we can do and what we should, should stay away from. Uh, but we do these tests internally typically. I mean, we have enough mm -hmm. power. We have, we have plenty of optical components and uh, we can do these tests here. Yeah. Because from, from our side, this is most, mostly the problem uh, uh, guaranteeing the uh, uh, high values for CW powers because there is no real standard. Mm -hmm. But when we have, uh, or when you have the uh, possibility to test it, we can uh, think of a cooperation you measure uh, um, our coatings, for example, and uh, um, find out both more uh, over this way. This is just the idea. Yeah, nothing wrong with that. We make it very easy. I sell you a laser. <laughs> <laughs> no, um, yeah. I, I, I don't want don't, don't want to be rude. Sorry for that. Um, that's definitely something that's interesting to to bring this forward, right? Um, there, there is some some um, makers of of coatings and components where we know and have tested, but basically um, yeah, every charge that you receive. Honestly, you don't know where exactly you are until you, you test it, you measure it, and maybe you destroy some. Yeah. Um, and there, as far as I understand, we also have quite reasonable understanding if you go to these coatings, when you put a certain power onto it, measure the temperature of these components to have an idea mm -hmm. what, what is the, the quality and if we can bring it up to 20 kilowatts or if this is a coating charge, which we should stay below 10 kilowatts or something like this. On the other hand, we want to make sure that all the coatings that we have on example, protection glasses can be used for all our laces. Yeah, we, we don't want to select them uh, for, for service issues to send them to a three kilowatt customer and this to a 10 kilowatt customer. Now we want to make sure that these coatings have a standard quality level. Mm. Of course. So, but as you mentioned, the, the absorption is also the only thing that we uh, think about. Uh, so you talked about the, the thermal uh, issues you have with with some optics, but finding out the right parameters uh, would be uh, the the goal to to bring a, a coating which is stable and repeatable. Um, so yeah, but we can contact uh, afterwards and see yeah. how how this can go. No problem. Thank you. 
So now I assume that I know what Gintari wants to say, but <laughs> there is a lot in the room uh, about uh, testing the optics. So Gintari, maybe you can briefly introduce or, or comment, and then, of course, we will have a talk later from you. <laughs> Yes, uh, hi. Uh, so I actually have a question. It's not so much of the comment, right? Um, and the question is, um, so so I'm from the testing company. We do laser damage testing and we also enter it testing with a CV regime. Um, so the question for Marcus is, uh, where you see the core value at testing at home? Is it more convenient? Is it because you have to test a lot or is it because the specificity of the lasers you use? I mean, why not choose external service? Uh, why do this at home? Sorry, I'm not 100% sure if I, if I get the question right. Uh, making the, the whole processing optics or um, what making it home? We are not doing our own coatings that we purchase. Uh, we are not doing our own glassware that we purchase. The design of the optics, the function of the optics um, by, by either simulation, ZMAX and some, something like this, we do internally and then build the optics following the requirements that we have in the processes. But the coatings and the glassware, we don't do ourselves. Uh, but you test it with CV power yourself at home, how much yeah. it can withstand, right? That, that's something we do because there, um, uh, I don't know anybody outside that could possibly use a 20 or 25 or 30 kilowatt laser to test it. Okay, I see. Fair enough. Thank you. Again, these lasers are for sale, so... <laughs> <laughs> Good to know. <laughs> <laughs> no, so I, I guess we will hear more about what is possible to test outside of companies and services also from uh, by Ginter and other speakers. So we maybe, yeah, I see Jan is nodding. So maybe let's go on first with uh, uh, Kyle following the agenda and then is uh, Jan's time. So he will have a surprise for you, I guess, Marcus. But uh, let's first give the floor. I'm really happy to have here Kyle from 26. So uh, if you are ready, the attention of everyone goes to two six. Thank you. <laughs> get this shared. It's the wrong screen, Kyle. If you yep, exactly. does it Perfect. every time. <laughs> <laughs> Perfect. It was fast <laughs> enough. Thanks a lot. The floor is yours. <laughs> okay, very good. Oh, thank you, Marcus. Uh, the, it was an excellent presentation and it, it, you're, you're looking at issues that uh, we at 26 are very eager to address and to understand in their entirety. Um, so a couple of years ago, we began doing a series of projects um, that are designed uh, towards providing optical solutions uh, at and above 20 kilowatts. Um, some of them uh, are directly addressed by IBS coding. Some of them are with doing much improved cooling in mirrors, both uh, aluminum and copper, uh, as well as a few other opportunities there. Um, and some things dealing with uh, extremely advanced materials uh, like our 70% our, uh, diamond uh, silicon carbide composite uh, and also some pure diamond solutions. Uh, but the ones that we have targeted um, towards the uh, larger market are actually coming up out of Sapphire. So the market that I'm addressing right here is the one that 26 has been coming, has been addressing for close to 50 years now, and that's uh, for industrial lasers. Um, the, the group that I'm with is the infrared group within 26. Um, they grow the crystal under my desk, it gets cored out, and then diamond turned or uh, polished uh, down the hall, and then we bring it back to halfway in between to do the coatings. Uh, so we have a, a greatly uh, integrated manufacturing capability that lets us control a lot of very nuanced details that we've been finding to be very important uh, as we've been targeting uh, this section of the market. Um, so you were addressing that you're currently using all fusilic optics. Um, and I have to assume that the organizers uh, knew what we were going after when they scheduled me right after you. Um, so <laughs> uh, our development has been creating accurate and optically uh, high performing uh, sapphire A-spheres. Um, so sapphire obviously is a very hard material uh, in, in many senses of the word. 
Um, unlike Fusilica, it is not amorphous. It has a strong crystalline structure, uh, which makes it uh, somewhat more sensitive uh, in terms of purity and also uh, can be quite difficult to work with. Um, but solving those challenges has uh, uh, been uh, good for our team and they've developed some really excellent manufacturing techniques to get us to where we are today. Um, the reason, the reason that we're putting in all of this work to pursue Sapphire um, is that it has 20 times the thermal conductivity of Fusilica. Um, what we found was that out of the box, any lens can perform, assuming you take the time to manufacture it correctly and you put in the effort and you test every step and you continue to verify every step. But once, a, once any optic gets to an end user, uh, it will be contaminated in some way, in some form. Uh, even the very best optics at CERN in high vacuum buried under the mountains of Switzerland become contaminated over time. Um, it, it does not matter where you are, or what you're doing, it happens. Um, so that, that is, was the start of our pursuit. And ultimately what we found was a substantial number of performance advantages. So obviously what we were targeting initially was to have a contamination tolerant uh, optical path. Um, something that could handle small amounts of spatter, the dust generated by flying optics. Uh, so every time you move a gear to refocus your head in a refractive system, it performs dust of some size, dust that absorbs and then dust that ultimately creates heat that must be pulled out of the head. Um, so when we began testing these optics, unfortunately, we don't have our own personal 20 kilowatt system. We had to go to some friends in academia um, but it took us about four hours to even successfully mount and test a few silica lens at 20 kilowatts, uh, whereas we were able to do the sapphire straight out of the box in about two minutes. Um, and then after performing the test, we were finding that the standard lifetime that we could expect out of the parts before they went into thermal runaway, before they would lose focus, before the process would be lost is about two and a half times longer. Um, which we think is the real value add for Sapphire. Um, also, when we started doing some cutting trials with other members of the organization and some outside organizations, they noticed that the time constant of Sapphire, the time that it takes to heat up and stabilize once you turn your laser on, uh, is about nine times faster than Fusilica. So for very sensitive processes, we found that many end users were heating up the laser off the material um, and that they really enjoyed the fact that they could begin their cuts even more quickly. Um, so just a few demonstrations. Obviously, it's always hard to take a picture of a clear optic, so you just see reflections of the, the light box. Um, but this was from one of our tests where we showed that we were within, I believe it was 0.03% of our expected flat top beam uh, when, when focusing, uh, so which is exactly equivalent to our few silica parts. Um, and then this was during a high contamination test. Uh, so we put enough powdered aluminum on a lens uh, to make it 10% absorbing. Uh, this is a terrible idea that nobody should ever try, uh, but we did it anyways. Um, and we successfully had aluminum molten clinging to the surface of the lens without ruining our focus, um, which was a substantial improvement uh, over the fusilica, which itself began to glow and um, started to melt to the, the lens mount. Um, we have a white paper detailing some of those things. Uh, we will be releasing another white paper in a few months uh, as we get additional laser incident damage threshold testing completed. And as we do some slightly more representative testing uh, closer to user to end user cases uh, that should happen by the end of the summer. Um, but ultimately what we're pursuing here is maximizing the utility of the lens to our end customer. Um, People are always asking us, what's the cost and lead time for your lenses? Um, but what we saw was driving that is that they always needed new lenses. Um, they always were suffering from downtime. Uh, they were always suffering from rebuild costs. Um, so we found that the cost of a lens is very much not always the dollars associated with purchasing the part, but the dollars associated with having your system not cutting uh, the dollars associated with the extra heads you need to purchase in order to maintain the system. Um, so that was ultimately uh, what we found. Um, sorry for the somewhat pithy quote, but it, it really is true. It, it doesn't matter how good you can make a part. It matters how good a part it is after a thousand hours in the machine. Um, 
So that's, that's pretty much where we are. Um, so this will be rolling out to the market probably over the, we've started releasing parts already, uh, but I think that will be fully productionized uh, in the next few months. Uh, and then after that, we should, if anybody's interested, we should start discussions. Um, Thank you very much for a yeah. great presentation. It is great to have two six here. You are in the news everywhere we look, especially over the last two weeks. <laughs> so it is great to talk today about the laser industry. Well, thank you so much for this. It is an epic meeting. Kyle, you know it's an epic meeting. So you know what's coming, right? The epic question. What can you do for them? What can they do for you? Uh, ultimately, I think that what we're seeing is a new path to higher powers. Um, and I, I think that's what everybody wants. Uh, in terms of what they can do for us, it's defining how the part is ultimately used. Uh, we've found that we need to be very careful and rigorous about our specifications on fusilica, and that translates to Sapphire and even more. So really understanding what your customer's use case is helps us optimize a part exactly to that application. You know, I never disagree with my members. I never, whatever, whatever you say, I always appreciate. But uh, today I have to, because you said something here a bit strange. You say, it doesn't matter how your part performs out of the box. It matters how it performs when your machine is running. And actually I say, it doesn't matter how good you make a part. It matters if you can actually prove it in terms of metrology. That's what I actually believe when it comes to high-end aspheric and high-end optics. How do you deal with metrology? And is there a room for cooperation here with the companies I have around me? Uh, there's definitely room there. Um, we have additional parts out for laser incident damage testing. Um, the first time we sent them out, the laser uh, testing group could not damage the lenses. Uh, so we need somebody who can put a slightly more focused uh, power. And that's why we uh, had to deliberately contaminate parts before we tested them because uncontaminated the parts, we couldn't cause them to fail. Um, so yes, there, there's still plenty of things there. Um, obviously, we never ship a part unless it has very high performance. Um, but what we found was that when any parts came back, it was usually due to some contamination further down the line. So I, let, let, let's yeah. talk a bit of metrology. Uh, can you start your camera? You, you look fantastic. I know how handsome oh, you are. Show sorry, it to the world. no, we, I, I tried with IT all morning and they could not get it operational. Oh, no, IT. We will never forgive you. But uh, okay, <laughs> let, let me talk to a couple of companies who I think they can, they can help you. At least they can collaborate. Taras, all the way from Ascent Optics. We have a company here, like 26, developing ultra high end optics. They even talk about, about the Sapphire optics today. Uh, uh, metrology is key. So it's a challenge. How do you help a company like Two Six Taras? You are muted, and I have a Mac which didn't break uh, to celebrate Thank such you. achievement. Uh, yes. <laughs> Hello to everyone. It's a true pleasure to be here. Uh, thank you for giving that floor to us. It was really a, a, a challenge for me to learn more about the laser optics I have had during the previous presentations. Talking to uh, the colleagues above. Um, we can help them definitely with the metrology issues, uh, not particularly with the testing of uh, damage threshold, but mostly with the uh, transmission reflection measurements of coatings at different angles, different polarizations. And we do this uh, fairly well going from DPV up to mid-wave infrared range. And um, you need to have an offline discussion for them, but I wanted yeah. you to, to say hello to him now because yeah. he, he, knows, uh, he knows now why I want to introduce the two of you to talk <laughs> offline. But yeah. Kyle, there is a, do you know about wavefront sensors? Yes. Uh, is there a challenge there? Because I have somebody, I think I have somebody from Imaging Optic in the room. Do I have anybody from all the way from South France here? Martial, yes, Martial okay. from Imaging Optic. Kyle knows our way from sensors. Kyle, uh, is there a challenge there that we can actually interact with Imaging Optic, Kyle? Uh, yes, that's something we've been approached on uh, for the solution uh, quite recently. And it definitely appears to be a good application for Sapphire. Marshall, yeah. is there any case, any case study here on Sapphire that you can actually say to Kyle? Uh, yes, we, we have some uh, capabilities to, to make some measurements on this uh, aspheric uh, Sapphire uh, substrate uh, optics. Uh, but uh, if you are testing some uh, internal damage, also, we, we can also do, do some uh, high resolution uh, damage uh, research inside your, your product. Or maybe if your coating is, is damage or maybe it's not damage, but we can 
you can maybe uh, having a, a good wave front, uh, uh, accurate wave front uh, diagnostic on it. So it, it can be a, can be also uh, something we can do. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Kyle, we continue. We have customers and suppliers for you on the customer side. Convergent Photonics. What do you have in mind? Um, for the transmission, I, I assume SF is fusilica backwards. <laughs> uh, no, let's, 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 uh, let's, uh, let's ask him. Let's, let, let he ask his own question. I love that. Andrea, Andrea Agliati, what do you have in mind? Right. So we never uh, consider um, Sapphire. Uh, we point most of the time uh, fused silica and uh, or BK7 for uh, low power uh, optics lasers. So um, just because Sapphire looks to me that has uh, much less transmissions uh, compared to this uh, fused silica or, uh, or other materials. Is that true or uh, I'm wrong? It can be true, um, especially for the equivalent amount of foreign material in the substrate. So if you have one ppm contamination in fusilica, you see one ppm loss. If you have one ppm in contamination in sapphire, you might see zero at some wavelengths. You might see a hundred uh, loss at other wavelengths. Uh, so it's very sensitive that way. So we had to do an extensive qualification of our suppliers to find something that could offer equivalent performance. I do believe that sapphire will always have slightly higher absorption than fusilica. Um, but we have managed to source material and to lock down our own supply of material uh, that has absorption that is lower even than some standard production in silica grades. We have more questions for you. One of my favorite companies manufacturing freeform optics is all the way in Rochester, New York, Optimax. And my friend Jessica is here with us. Jessica, what's on your mind? Thank you, Jose. Uh, hi, Kyle. Thank you very much for your presentation today. Um, I think at the beginning you mentioned a, a material, a diamond silicon carbide composite material. If I heard you correctly, can you talk a little bit more about that material? Sure. Um, and I believe this will be of interest to anybody who is generating um, high power uh, back at the laser source. Um, it's a silicon carbide uh, diamond ceramic. Uh, we can push up to about 70% diamond content. Uh, which puts us uh, just shy of 1,000 watts per meter Kelvin thermal conductivity. Um, for those of you who aren't intimately familiar with that, that's two and a half times better than the best copper available on the market. Um, and it does it with about three, three and a half times less coefficient of thermal expansion. Um, obviously, it's incredibly non-reactive um, and has a number of other benefits, but we can talk about that more offline. And I can put you in touch with the division that produces it. And now we go to my favorite company developing IBS coatings for optics. We go to my friend Remy from Optoman. Remy Gijus, CEO of Optoman. What's on your mind? Uh, thank you, Kyle. Uh, just a single question, actually, about the surface quality and surface uh, irregularities. Uh, I've been talking to manufacturers of substrates uh, made up out of sapphire. That seems to be a struggle, actually. Uh, did you get close to the polishing quality close to pure silica? Uh, yes, I would now say that it's equivalent. Um, the, All right. It was incredibly difficult. Uh, I believe this has been going on for 18 months, maybe two years since we did our first tests. Um, there's very, very subtle and interrelated uh, challenges with producing sapphire to a quality equivalent to fusilica. Um, and you... due to the higher refractive index, we've actually been pushing slightly beyond fusilica um, because of the higher refractive index, any error is multiplied. Um, so that's been a challenge for the team, but uh, our initial results are showing that we finally surpassed that limitation. Can you brag a little bit about um, uh, the roughness values? You, you can um, depends a lot on how much departure. Um, we've been down is under 10 angstroms, uh, which is the point at which I need to go recalibrate my interferometer uh, to confirm. <laughs> so okay. I usually don't shoot for anything below that. Um, and I don't think that we've shipped anything below 30. Okay, so we're talking about 10 angstroms our RMS, yeah? Correct. Okay. Respectable. Thank you very much. I love when, when Remy, you say, can you brag about, and that's always a tricky question. I think there's going to be a really interesting follow-up. But I want to go with this fantastic round of Q&A. I want to go back to the customer side. I want to go to Marcus. I want to know your views after this discussion about Sapphire Optics. What's your take here and what room for cooperation do you foresee? 
I mean, I've made th three notes throughout the presentation, Carl, and thanks for that. Um, one is about cost question mark, but maybe we don't have to discuss it here. The second note that I made was, uh, you're mentioning an export license on your slides. Does it mean that this technology is exp ex actually dual use listed? Um, the technology that is specifically in these slides is not. We can ship this anywhere in the world at any time. Uh, there are a few implementations of Sapphire that will be limited to the US, uh, okay. but those were not discussed. That's something I'm required to put on every slide. Uh, for the time being. Okay, good information because I can't afford it to ask an export license if I put a specific lens into my <laughs> optics. Yeah. Um, another point you mentioned is that you consider the lifetime being 2.5 times longer than a classic optic. I mean, how do you how do you determine the lifetime of a, of a, of a glass uh, lens, fused silica lens? Uh, what, what is the lifetime of a fused silica lens and how do you say it's 2.5 times longer? So for any given use case, uh, you typically generate particulate contamination or even chemical contamination at a given rate. You know, how often are you refocusing the optic? How often are you generating new dust? How often are you changing out your uh, cover slides? So in a given use case, we found that it's typically about two and a half times longer before we're required to go back and rebuild the head, before we're required to go back and set up a clean room clean the optics and then reassemble before continuing cutting. So we're able to maintain a stable process for longer for equivalent co contamination. Okay. Um, and then back to the cost. Um, obviously it's incredibly varied um, and we're still building up a full cost model. Um, we've mostly been in prototype orders now. Um, so I am going to have to point you to sales on that. Um, I, we're targeting um, Actually, you know what? Sales will yell at me. Please call sales. Don't <laughs> let, don't don't let sales right yell people. at anybody. They are really rude. Be careful with sales. I always tell that to everybody I meet. Don't, don't mess with sales, mess with R&D. Thank you uh, very much, Kai, for a great presentation. Marcus, thank you very much. You're going to love the next presentation, Marcus. Stay tuned. Because we go to the capital of Czech Republic. We go to Prague to talk about one of the success stories of the European ecosystem on laser R&D. We go to High Lace. Jan Banda is with us to tell us about the epic question it's answered. The floor is good yours. Jan, Vanda, you are muted. What do you think, Francesca? Should we send Max okay. like this one to everyone who Can has that problem? Now? Yes, loud and clear. Great. Great. So let me share the screen. And here we go. OK. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, I'm here to talk about laser in the image visual testing at Highlights, which is uh, our, our uh, mother facility. Um, I will go through that quite uh, fast, so we have more time to discuss. It will be more about to simulate and present what we can do for you and uh, where we can, uh, or on which topic we can meet. So first, uh, what are uh, our missions and target areas? Uh, basically, the whole facility is dedicated to development of high average power pulse lasers and related applications. So that's uh, why we have here uh, LIDP testing because uh, we are running uh, both ISO standard and customized tests uh, to uh, which which is basically targeted to optic producers because we are using a lot of optic components uh, and we are cooperating with uh, laser optic producers to laser developers and laser device uh, device integrators which is part of uh, our job we are actually building lasers and uh, we would like to have our devices as reliable as possible. And of course, laser and users, because part of our activities uh, is uh, on uh, laser uh, applications. Uh, of course, uh, this all expands to everybody else. That means if you are a laser developer or optic producer or laser and user, the same service and the same way of consultation and help with your issues we can offer to you as well. Uh, what is our current state? What we have uh, available here is uh, actually uh, mostly, uh, mostly we are using uh, pulse laser because we are dedicated to the, to the uh, that pulp solid state uh, pulse laser. So uh, we have two base system operating at 1030 nanometer. 
first is picosecond system called Perla, which is producing currently 20 millijoules uh, round Gaussian uh, beam, uh, which we can uh, scale up for the testing in spot size from 0 0.2 to 3 millimeter diameter. Uh, at the same wavelength, it's operating uh, nanosecond system, which is producing 10 nanosecond pulses, uh, which can be either around Gaussian beam uh, with diameter of uh, 0 0.4 millimeters. All these uh, systems are highly stabilized and uh, with uh, precision diagnostics, which uh, give us uh, quite good advantage in the in the sense of uh, accuracy and uncertainty. So we can determine our fluence uh, for the for the testing, despite of the fact that it's a statistical value to the 10% uh, margin tolerance. What is our uh, main advantage is that uh, we have uh, available square top head beam with uh, six joules with the three by three millimeters, which is fixed size of the beam. So we are able to do the test and to do the experiments with the really big uh, spot size. Also, we are able to do the test with a uh, continuous system, either 940 nanometers, uh, which is 13 kilowatts. That's actually, uh, that's, uh, actually the system which is uh, currently used. And uh, we also have available, uh, this, is, uh, this is a new thing. We have available 1.9 micron source with uh, the power of uh, 200 watts. Uh, we are able to test optics or any sample uh, with dimension up to six inches, so basically it's 100 millimeter aperture uh, with weight up to 1.5 kilograms. So we are able to test even uh, big uh, preforms or, or uh, large substrate before they are get, uh, cut for the, uh, for the coating, for example. Uh, we are not limited to the shape. Uh, we are also able to test both opaque or transparent. So uh, our diagnostic is suitable both for the reflectance and uh, transmittance uh, samples. Uh, large uh, span of uh, angle of incidence. We are testing also, or we have availability also of uh, testing under the vacuum or non corrosive gases, pressurized non corrosive gases. And uh, we are running uh, both ISO compliant procedures, one on one SL1 or custom procedures, which are raster scan or R on one. So now, how it does look? Uh, our laboratory is a clean environment. So, uh, to make sure that uh, we are not inducing any uh, contaminant during the test, it's uh, ISO class seven, what you can see on the picture is actually the experimental chamber for the uh, LIDT test themselves and the optical table with the setups for the beams we are guiding to the, to the experiment. Uh, this is the view inside the chamber. So you can, you can actually hear, uh, can see the sample mounting, micrometric mounting with the camera for the mean detection. Uh, the chamber itself is quite uh, big to uh, two uh, cube meters of space, so uh, we are really suited for, for large stuff. And uh, to ensure the compliance and uh, reproducibility of the test, uh, the procedures are automated and uh, the diagnostic is automated as well. So, uh, if you want something uh, or if uh, we set up uh, the standard or, or some uh, reference, uh, let's say, experiment, then we can reproduce it every time to make sure that the conditions are every time the same. Uh, so far, what we done and what we have experienced with, uh, we are uh, used to test uh, anti-reflection coating. This is like typical example from uh, one of the projects we have with the company developing the uh, optical coatings, uh, the same applies on uh, the electric mirrors, uh, basically the same uh, user case. We are also used to test special materials. This is example of the YAC crystals, which has uh, one side coated with the anti-reflection coating and another side uh, coated with the high reflectivity coating. 
uh, it's not limited just to the actual stuff. Of course, we are able to test sapphire or uh, or other uh, materials as well. Uh, I can mention also such exotic material as calomel, uh, for example. That's that's uh, some uh, something which we did recently. Uh, we have also quite some experience with the testing and developing optical fibers for the high power or high pulse energy applications. And uh, of course, all high power lasers are usually uh, related with the wide scale optics. And that's uh, something particular we are targeting on really uh, big optics for four inch or even six inch uh, uh, big stuff. Uh, what we introduced last year uh, in order to connect more with the application era is basically process window assessment, where we have a particular material and we are optimizing the conditions regarding the most effective setup of, uh, in this case, it's the most effective setup for ablation of uh, protective coating from the, from the uh, machining tool. So as the result, we are able to develop uh, such, uh, such uh, graphs where you can easily track what is, the, what is the best effectivity regarding number of pulses, meaning the, uh, the time you need for the treatment, the energy you require from the laser system and the ablated volume in the case you want to clean particular components. And uh, one of our, let's say, state of the art thing is, uh, as I mentioned before, testing with the, uh, with the big beam. So what you can see here is uh, one uh, of our application where we are testing a special coating with the, uh, with the basically raster scan on the top. This is the damaged area. We were basically interested to whether the specific part can withstand uh, big beam with the high fluence. Uh, this is usually the pain in the neck uh, for most of the application. The fact that uh, as you increasing the beam size with the standard component, you're increasing your chance to hit the defect compared with the small spot. And that's usually why you uh, don't see uh, in the real application with the big beam why you don't match the damage threshold, which is measured with the small beam. Here on the graph, you can easily track uh, how different result you can get if you test the same component with different methods and different beam size. So first is Gaussian beam, 400 microns. Second is Gaussian beam, 200 microns. You can see that just the expanding the size, doubling the size of the Gaussian beam, uh, there was a quite significant change of the damage that was we measured. Of course, raster scan, when we scanned over the whole aperture uh, and we activated several defects, the damage threshold or the fluence at which uh, the part was uh, damaged was much lower. And uh, when we reproduce the same with the big uh, beam, square top head beam, uh, we got even much lower fluence at uh, which the respective component was uh, safe to operate. So that's the that's the basically the motivation of why we are doing this. Uh, we want to get with our test as close to the real uh, operational conditions as possible. So uh, we are quite uh, or or. I can say it in the way that since we are research and development facility, uh, we need to keep evolving to be still on the top or, or uh, to come still with the new things. So uh, what we are installing uh, at the moment is uh, harmonics for the picosecond and nanosecond beam line. So within, uh, this is actually a bit old. It was four months at the beginning of the year. So by the end of this month, actually, we will have available harmonics for nanosecond and picosecond beamline. And uh, we are currently in the process of uh, ISO accreditation. So uh, we will be approved to for, for declaration of conformity regarding the damage threshold measurements. 
So in particular, uh, when you need uh, materials validation for for safety or healthcare, this is this is uh, something which is a must. Thank you so much for a great presentation, Jan. This is an epic meeting. Remember, this is an epic meeting. So you have to answer the epic questions. So tell us, tell us how can the rest of the members help High Lays? How, how can you help them? Jan? Yeah, yeah. Okay. Did, so. did you get surprised <laughs> by my question? <laughs> yeah, I was expecting that you're going to continue. So. <laughs> Sorry about it. Yeah, so uh, now I'm basically at the end of the presentation. So that was uh, that was what I wanted to share with you, and uh, what I wanted to present with you. Uh, I would like to mostly focus on our user case, which is uh, basically the testing of the large optic of the special coatings, development of the uh, new coatings. So particularly for the for the later components uh, producers who want to come with some. New Thank you so much, Jan. We have a question for you in the room coming all the way from Optoman. Remigius, what's on your mind? Um, I have in my mind, uh, let's say, a problem, which is a daily problem. Uh, I see that everybody has a 1064 nanometer capabilities, measuring in 10 nanoseconds, 10 hertz, and etc. Yeah. Um, but we need to get some optics tested at 1053, nan uh, 1053 nanometers. 10 nanosecond, 10 hertz. <laughs> what do I do here? <laughs> yeah, <laughs> this well, is a huge problem. Actually, actually, 1053 is usually not a big problem because when you, or usually when you have coatings, uh, they have some bandwidth. No, we are talking about the thin film polarizer here. That's a big problem. Yeah, okay. So you need, exactly. <laughs> yeah, well, that, that, that's the trick. I mean, um, yeah, then you need somebody who has uh, source uh, operating at that. 10, uh, 53. That's, uh, that's uh, pretty simple. Actually, we have some quite good experience with the development of the of the nanosecond coatings, where we tested the coating technology at 1030, and then the manufacturers tweaked the de design a little bit of the coating. They tweaked the coating procedure a little bit, and they are producing these coatings for. Uh, maybe 10, 10, 50 as well, or 10, 64. Uh, because the wavelengths are quite close together, you are using the same materials, you just increase the thickness of the laser a little bit. And if nothing else is changed, basically you can use the results from the 1030 to, to, this, to this technology as well. So Generally, was, you was, can uh, find the <laughs> coating technology. I was just simply expecting that, hey, hey, hey guys, we have this laser in house somewhere, you know, laying <laughs> and, on the ground, uh, so, but I know. <laughs> yeah, we are, we are actually going to buy this laser, so let's All right, so we are thinking about it. We're going to have it as well, so we can test it directly. Not All with right, the Could good you specify the laser that you need? Could you specify a bit on, the, on the, 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 this laser, both Remy and Yang? Uh, you mean what kind of laser is that? Yes. Uh, it's a... 1053 nanosecond laser, high power laser one. Uh, so, but uh, we are talking about a first article inspection stuff. So uh, mm -hmm. uh, LIDT has to get qualified there. And uh, yeah, I, I don't see any chances to get a LIDT uh, test done quickly because we're talking about a specific product which does not work at 1064 as well mm -hmm. as at 1053 nanometers. Uh, yeah, so I was uh, struggling and um, I cannot find a solution so quickly. If anybody in the whole Epic community <laughs> has a laser that would like to test, I am happy to pay for the shipping expenses and arrive both and Czech Republic and Lithuania with that laser to test it in-house. <laughs> Thank you so much, Jan. Thank you, Remy Gijus, for this great cooperation. We want to go, Francesco, what do you think? We go to the next speaker and then we go to Marcus from Presitech to have a nice discussion with our favorite laser head manufacturer. Back to Francesca. I, yeah, so now I just wanted to ask one thing to Jan because we, you were yeah. nodding a lot when, when uh, uh, we were talking with the Marcus at the beginning, so Marcus from Laserline, <laughs> uh, talking about the, the 20 kilowatts. So you are there at 14, right? Just to uh, specify yeah, in your slide. It's actually a source from the Laserline. <laughs> ah, okay. I was about to say that it's a laser line laser, yeah. <laughs> okay, then I guess that uh, <laughs> Marcus knows already his answer. So if you cannot uh, test the twenty kilowatts, it's. Uh... <laughs> I think I think we have even more powerful laser line we are using. So it's 
for the pumping of the of the pulse laser. So uh, actually, if there is a need to go to a higher power, we can just disconnect it and use it for the testing. So I guess laser guy is gonna be pretty happy to do that, but whatever. <laughs> Okay, good. But uh, and then one other thing, you say in your perspective that you are going to to picosecond lasers, but there is mm -hmm. nothing yet on femtosecond, right? Is it correct or is it in the second mm -hmm. future? Let's say. Yes, we are not actually because uh, actually, if you have hundreds of femtoseconds, uh, you got basically the same results like with one picosecond. So there is no reason to go there to like uh, to to have two hundred or three hundred femto. And uh, if you have less than 100 femtosecond, then you are in completely different area when where you don't even have the high power sources yet. So uh, there is no that big interest regarding. Okay, the, so that uh, that is your time. statement. That's uh, okay. That is your opinion. Then in case someone has something to comment yeah, on well, this, maybe, maybe maybe somebody will come with, with, with sure. some sort, then, uh, and then it's gonna be interesting for us as well. Yeah, very good. So then if you think about it, all of you, in the meanwhile, it's time to go to Nathan, right? It's time for a whole hour. And uh, thanks a lot for being here today, Nathan. And you, uh, the floor is yours. <laughs> okay, so I'll share my slides. So we had some very interesting talks. Do you see my slides, by the way? Yeah, okay. So we had some interesting talks from LaserLine about very high power systems. And it chimes well with me because I'm from Holor. We are a diffractive optics component manufacturer and now actually a micro optics manufacturer because we also offer refractive solutions. And it is aimed at the shaping of high power laser systems. Of course, application aimed shaping. And our customers are usually integrators that build machines using our diffractive optical components. And in this talk, I wanted you said, challenges to the laser optics, which is very general. So I, I will try to focus about specifically laser glass cutting, which was not really mentioned before here, but I'll just give a brief overview of what's diffractive optics and what we do. So for those less familiar with them, diffractive optical components are flat, thin windows that by delaying the phase of the light, they create any phase profile you want on the wavefront. And by this, they can create whatever you want at focus or far field of the system. When I say whatever you want, it's basically splitting, shaping. I'll show some, a bit of the applications later on. These elements are produced using semiconductor methods. So we have absolute angular accuracy. You, you don't get that in refractive optics and lenses for us because this is defined by the spacings rather than the features. We have total no tolerances on angles, so we don't have any tolerance on things like EFL or separations. They have high LDTs because they are flat. They don't have an edge, they don't have curvatures. The AR coating is always getting the light perpendicular, so they really handle high power well. And we have our own uh, suppliers for coatings and can, of course, coat at higher tolerances if needed. And the elements are thin and compact. You can integrate them anywhere you want. We make them on fused silica, all grades from deep UV to the uh, IR coning 7979, and also in zinc selenide for people working closer to the mid IR. So what can you do with diffractive optics? Basically, the main families are beam shapers, like we saw in laser line, there are beam shaping diffuser for multi-mode lasers, like these shapes. I hear this brazing diffuser, Mikey Mouse is very similar to what you saw, I guess, before. And uh, there are, of course, analytical beam shapers, uh, that are mostly used in high precision applications like micro machining, where people need very accurate pad placement, solar panels, these sorts of applications that utilize our beam shapers and these have no speckle, unlike diffusers. There are beam splitters that can create whatever distribution you want to do with orders with control separations. And today, what I want to talk about, that we have the focal manipulators. These are elements that shape the foci of the light along the propagation direction you use them with an external focus optics or not, as the case may be. And they're mostly used in the field of cutting of thin transparent materials or not so thin, uh, such as glass cutting, which is rapidly gaining currency. And this is what I want to focus about when we say challenges of laser optics. So one of the biggest challenges our customers pose to us, and it, it started, I think, in Epic, uh, something around 2018 in a talk with, uh, I think it was Jose, uh, was, um, okay, we want to cut glass. And to cut glass, one of the best methods 
today is to use something called filamentation dicing, where you use around one micron wavelength, where and you rely on nonlinear absorption processes to weaken the glass. And to do that, you need very special optics. You want to get very high intensities. You want to get fast repetition rates. You want picosecond or femtosecond lasers, or ten, hundreds of femtosecond lasers. And you want the focus to be tightly focused, something like one to five micron spot over the entire thickness of the glass, which is usually one more than one millimeter. So uh, if you know a bit about optics, I guess you know that's basically impossible to do. Yeah, because uh, this is what you get from normal focus optics. If the focusing is tight, it diverges. So then you need to do some sort of manipulations to make depth of focus larger while maintaining this sort of focus line over the entire white with the same intensity. Now, there is a solution to do that sometimes with simple bezel optics, axicons, etc. But these have this sort of red distribution you see here, which is highly unsympathetic. It has a long tail. And the energy is not limited to the work area here above some threshold. You're wasting all this energy. And also, it has some effect on the material, usually. So our solution for that was to develop the deep cleave focus optics, which I'm holding in my hand right now. And uh, this is a test piece, but still exactly the right dimensions, which is basically an integrated focusing solution. It's equivalent to a high power objective similar to the ones used in cutting optics. It has very high NA of uh, 0 0.35. It focuses down to two microns on axis. And it provides a very effective solution because it gives you both the depth of focus. We have versions for one, two, three millimeters in air. In glass, of course, you will have more. Uh, while still maintaining the thin and narrow focusing uh, that's required for such applications. Now, the deep cleave module, each one of them is assembled at our uh, facilities here with the diffractive inside done by us. All components are in-house. And it has this sort of stable vessel distribution where the internal lobe is always in the same intensity. So that's for the application of the main cut of the glass. But today, I want to talk about another interesting application in glass cutting, which is the bevel cut. We, we have seen some customers coming to us saying, OK, great. So I can cut with the main cut. I can cut my glass at a nice rate. But a lot of uh, cases where we're using glass, people need beveling or chamfering. You want to remove something at 45 degrees, around 200, 300 microns from the edge, both for safety reasons, because people don't want to cut their fingers on that, and to increase the mechanical stability of the cut glass. Now, this is a different sort of application. So people say, well, let's just take your cutting optics and tilt it at 45 degrees. But there are intrinsic limits. All these high NA cutting limit, uh, optics have short working distances. Ours has 7 millimeters, but others are similar, 7, 5, 10. And mechanically, it's impossible. <laughs> to reach the glass when you are effectively not touching it. Also, you need to rotate the module all along the cut. So it's not really feasible to do with large module that you need to rotate to stick it always at the 45 degrees angle. And people come to us and ask us, OK, so what can you do to solve this channel? And one of the approaches that we have offered now is the, using basically the multifocal diffractive optical element, which is a single element with a sort of Basic cutting optics can be a single spherical lens. And instead of making the foci in a line along the focus, we shift them at a line of 45 degrees. The result is inside the material similar to a diffuser with high speckling, as you see below. But still, the main line of intensity is nicely at 45 degrees, while the foci are still coming, not tilted, but vertically. And you can rotate this easily by just rotating the DOE. So this is a sort of solution for really challenging application that we have come up with. And now we're working also on a different solution, because this is highly de demanding at NA 0 0.4, where the, this transition hopefully will be smooth. However, usually the chamfering or beveling quality requirement is lower than from the main cut, because a lot of times it's roughly ground. So this sort of, this, of solution is really applicable for a lot of people using glass cutting that want to do a secondary process and get bevels afterwards. And that's what I wanted uh, to talk about. Thank you for the time. And I would love to answer any one of your needs uh, or the usual epic question if you want. Uh, exactly. So you know the epic question. Yeah, you yeah, want yeah. the epic question. So what can you do for them? What can they do for you? So where there is room for a collaboration, there you go. <laughs> OK, so I'll go back here for that. Uh, so what can we do for you? We can shape the light. Uh, to whatever you want. Just give us the optical challenge, what you want to get at the end of your optical system, 
and we will offer the best solution we can come up with, which is usually the best solution you can find, if I may sound bold. Uh, and we can do that from 193 nanometers wavelengths up to 10.6. What, we, what uh, you can do for Holor, you can give us tough challenges. <laughs> and uh, basically, you can, if you're at least an academy, we have some cooperation with Highlays, for example, you can help us validate some concepts that we're trying to develop into the market, like our D-Light texturing idea, or even the deep cleave where we're trying to cooperate with Fluence, which always also is on the talk. We have quite a, a few corporations that came up from Epic, but we're always open to more. Thank you, Francesca. Thanks a lot, thanks a lot. So we have a question from uh, Laser Components, right, Rene? Uh, we can also unshare your screen. Uh, not, very good, Nathan. <laughs> okay, uh, so um, yeah. Thank you for the presentation. Um, I just want to know what is what is the uh, basic uh, differences between the, the deep cleave module and uh, standard uh, cutting solutions for uh, glass uh, that are on the market. Oh, thank you, Marina, for this excellent question. So basically, uh, most glass cutting solutions on the market are uh, either they, use, they utilize a simple bezel beam generator like an axicon, and then they don't have the sort of flat top distribution in the z-axis that gives you the good process results. Also, they do not come integrated. They are not a full solution. Our solution is basically full cutting optics. You just adjust it to the system, align it, and that's it. It works to focus. Other solutions like using refractive axicon, for example, usually you need to add some sort of high power objective or and with high NAs, which is of similar cost to our system and gives worse performance, basically. So um, this is this is the only component you need. You have the, the collimated uh, beam entering the deep cleave, and then you have your focus, uh, the elongated focus. Correct. It doesn't need any other optics. Not like our component solutions. It's it's a model solution. You see, it's basically you put the beam here comes out here. Very nice. We always like when you have the, your stuff on the table. Yeah. Of course, for big lasers, it's impossible. But uh, for those who can, <laughs> it's, the, <laughs> it's, the, it's the advantage. So thanks a lot. So Rene, also for the question. So now there's a question from Jan from ILAs. You can ask yourself. Yeah, hello. Uh, I was wondering what is the power limitation or energy limitation when we are talking about the picosecond here? Okay, so we had quite a few experiments with customers. For this application, if we're talking about the deep cliff, yes? Uh, yeah. Basically, we, had, we have not found, since we went to the new design, because we had issues with the similar design previously, we have not had any issues with any laser damage. Typically, pulses of, uh, I would say, two millijoules, 10 millijoules, something like that. I have not seen lasers above that. It, usually this is 10 kilohertz to 40 kilohertz. You don't have a lot of uh, pulse energy. Yeah, there. sure. I, I mean, we were using some, some uh, diffractive yeah. optics, but uh, um, we weren't encouraged enough to go mm -hmm. above uh, one millijoule. Because we have uh, I think it depends on the beam size. Yes, this is this one here. I control the beam size because I know what I define as input mm -hmm. so I could design it. Uh, of course, you can share with me the specifics and I will and then, then we can give you more accurate feedback about based <laughs> on our other customers. Yeah. OK, thank you. Thanks a lot. So now it was clear. I wanted to talk absolutely also with our second Marcus in the room today eh? <laughs> from Pesitec. And now talking about cut, laser cutting, I guess I have to ask you, Marcus. So of course, you have a lot of challenges for optics. <laughs> you have a lot of experience. So I cannot not ask you, what is your interest today? What did you hear that is interesting? What is your opinion? Impress us as usual, Marcus. <laughs> um. Everybody understands me. Okay. Yes, we hear you very well. Okay. Yes. So um, yes, I was more in the in the first presentations actually because what we are facing right now in laser cutting is a trend which uh, actually I haven't expected that uh, dramatically. So this is extremely high power cutting heads. So we are go going for thirty kilowatts right now uh, as a standard 
cutting it without any zoom optics. Um, and we already find uh, competitors in China which are um, providing 40 kilowatts uh, cutting heads. And they all go for high power, uh, high, uh, high, high thickness. So um, obviously the, the seconds you, you, you save <laughs> when cutting with 20 kilowatts versus 30 kilowatts seems to be an issue and seems to be something they care about. But uh, um, as we already heard from, from the other Marcus <laughs> in the first presentation, um, it's, it's not that uh, easy or that um, um, uh, 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 it's not rocket science, that's true, but it's ob obviously not that easy to provide uh, a processing heads, uh, which uh, uh, first can stand the power and second uh, stay stay clean stay clean enough so uh, to 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 uh, um, work 24 7 without any 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 um, uh, manual or change of uh, of materials or even heating up and, and breaking down so um, for those who are providing the optics and for those uh, that means the glasses as Marco said and for those who are providing the coating, this is for, for sure uh, uh, very important today as well. But for us, bringing all that stuff into a housing, uh, the issue of uh, 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 working with that device, um, being able to plug and unplug the fiber without any contamination of the fiber uh, uh, plug or uh, any 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 dirt falling onto the first element, optical element, and uh, having a, a clean uh, protection glass and a tight uh, put, uh, housing. This is an issue which is uh, getting more and more important as well. And uh, surprisingly, as I said, for cutting. So uh, we were facing that for welding, and this is the uh, the, the daily uh, work from 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 laser line to, to to provide optics for for joining. Let's put it like that for joining. Um, but we are now facing that for cutting as well, and we are facing high numerical aperture lasers for cutting as well. So uh, uh, the 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 uh, um, ring spot lasers like the arm laser from from uh, from uh, coherent. Or the competing product from N Light, or the competing product from uh, from uh, Trumpf, uh, getting into cutting as well. And uh, so uh, the 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 inner spot has got a very uh, high quality. So high quality means high um, uh, um, intensity. High intensity means high thermal load. High thermal load means how to get rid of thermal load. How to save. Or, or to protect it from from uh, any kind of uh, of uh, focal shift. So um, that's why uh, I, I'm impressed of what Hollow uh, just just uh, brought up with glass cutting. But if we talk about metal cutting, it's a completely different issue these days. Yeah, Nathan, please you can oh. reply. <laughs> if I may comment on that, yeah. there are two issues there here that were interesting. Thank you for that, by the way. It's so of course multi tens of kilowatts. <laughs> is a different challenge and different category i did not focus on here but there are two points where we can maybe help one is what we call diffractive other mats, which is making atomization of focal lenses by adding diffractive power so that it offsets the heating and then you have focal stability this is something we can do you add to a normal lens stack a diffractive optic that counters the thermal effects of the focus shift and the other one, which is maybe interesting, is the fact that maybe arm lasers are not so necessary because you can get this sort of ring mode, even adjustable, with the correct type of beam shaping. And then your optics do not need to handle having this sort of ring with high angles at side. You generate them very close to the focus optics, and that's it. All the roads along that is just your output from your collimator. We, we play around a little bit with yeah. the with the intensity uh, or uh, power distribution between ring and core. We play around a little bit with some kind of oscillation, power mm -hmm. oscillation of the ring and core, which is not possible with your solution. That's why the ring and spot device uh, and the flexibility of having two lasers 
separately being uh, mm -hmm. uh, 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 controlled. Yeah. It's quite important. I am aware of that, but there is a solution that is adjustable that can, using two passive components, you can adjust the ratio between the center and the ring. Maybe we can talk about that later. Okay, uh, thank you. Yeah, that that uh, that is a good conclusion, Nathan. <laughs> you the, the good way is to interest Marcus and then keep it for afterwards. That <laughs> was a good move. Now, also about to talking about the uh, cutting, I have to say, let's uh, check on your agenda in your, or your calendar from fifth of July. If you want to hear more about laser cutting and challenges, that's the right way. There's an online technology meeting only on that. So keep it down, write down all your challenges also from here to that day, so that. We we can talk about it even more in detail. So now we maybe go on with the, our agenda to, of today. <laughs> and it's time now for uh, Lidaris, so for Ginter, eh, to take the floor. Are you ready? Yes, I see the slides coming. <laughs> yes. And you are muted, so the floor is yours. <laughs> yes, great. Um, so hello again. As you know, my name is Gintare, and I'm a project manager at the company Lidaris, which provides professional laser damage testing. And today I will continue the talk about the deadly <laughs> challenge for laser optics, which is known as laser-induced damage. And with our customers, we joke around that it's not really the question of if, but it's rather the question of when the optical element will get damaged. And laser damage comes in various shapes and forms. And it's actually a complex phenomena, but let's look at the complexity of it with a very simple example. Imagine that you're driving a car and suddenly your car stops. The fact is that the car is not moving. However, the reasons why the car is not moving might be very different. In fact, they can be multiple or even trigger each other. It's also very intuitive that if you fix the flat tire, you're not guaranteed the safe trip. Your car might stop due to the engine problems in the next few hundred of kilometers. So something similar happens in the laser damage world. A laser damage became a single name for very different problems. For instance, we know that laser damage can be triggered by materials and substrate problems, such, such as subsurface defects or bell bilayer. It can be caused by coating technology, causing growth of the nodular defects. It can be something uh, simple as poor handling and packing, or it can be influenced by the environment the optics operates in. So how all this information could be used to overcome the challenge of laser damage? Well, first of all, it gives you a rough idea where to look uh, for the improvement areas or the failure areas. And then as in any good R&D projects, you will have to run trial and error approach with some feedback. You can't cut the chase here. You will have to check some parameters to optimize your process. But what's important here is that you will choose a, the right feedback or trial method. Uh, and that's where the smart partner is useful because standard LIDT testing is not always the best approach in custom situations. For instance, let's say you want to optimize the optical element for manufacturing cause defects. If the defect density is rare, the standard statistical testing might miss those defects and overestimate the LIDT. In Ladaris, we suggest to use raster scan approach in this case, which catches these black swans, if you will, on the optical surface and give you a more realistic idea about the optical element and also a more realistic idea about your actual improvement. Another interesting case is that not everyone actually cares about defects. Some, uh, for some companies, longevity and the fatigue of the optical element is important. And in this case, the failure mechanism is different. It's usually associated with so-called intrinsic defects and electronic states inside the optical element. In this case, standard S on one procedure is, is actually just fine, but there is um, an interesting factor that uh, usually it's tested up to 200 pulses. And on this issue, that's not always a good idea to do so because you need, uh, you need uh, more data to see the fatigue effect. 
So, uh, yeah, and furthermore, if you want to say something about longevity of the optical element, you might need more advanced statistical analysis here. So we gather all this insight about the challenges both on laser damage and laser damage metrology by participating in multiple R&D projects. Uh, just to make a few, it was Espresso with ESA and currently running uh, Trust and uh, Star and Unipulse project. Actually, one of our partners are here in this meeting as well. You can see Optoman. And uh, for this project, uh, there was a successful insight as well, because here the study was led by uh, Linus Malakis on the Daris part, and the goal was to uh, optimize specific uh, high power optical elements. And in this case, we found very useful when we can separate different failure modes, catastrophic from color change. By separating them and applying advanced analysis, we were able to look at the long-term prognosis of these optical elements for two different failure modes. So if any of this seems appealing to you that sometimes you have an issue or not benefiting from LIDT results or just need uh, to find out what's going on with your optical element, I should just say that you can find a partner in those questions uh, in Lithuania, company Ledaris, we started uh, eight years ago to test commercially. We actually had the startup of Vilnius University, and today we serve over 130 companies worldwide. And we are still into the research and R&D a lot. Three members of the Ledaris company won uh, SPI reward and laser damage symposium. And um, to answer the epic question, so what we can do at Ledaris, we can test at wide range of irradiation conditions. We can we started to test at CV regime, including test, uh, looking at the temperatures of the optical elements when doing that. We test at nano, pico, and femtosecond regimes. We do see the need to test even at a few hundred of femtoseconds. We can go from infrared to UV pulse range and we can test in ear and vacuum and even play with temperatures a little bit. And we have experience to run uh, both standard and non-standard um, testing procedures. And then what you can do for us, so of course, we're always looking for routine testing of the optical elements. Maybe be integrated into the part of, of your optics characterization. And then, of course, uh, we are always welcome for you to share your LIDT problems and maybe find companies who are interested in design of experiment approach for optics of optimization in, on their end. And uh, we are always open for R&D projects. As you saw, we, we run them a lot to get value insights and understand what the shortcomings of metrology for uh, commercial part. And uh, again, we, we are the users. I mean, we, we need stable lasers and we need quality optical elements to run our own systems. So that's short. Fantastic. Thank you very much, Acho, for a great presentation. Let's see what kind, of, what kind of things we can do to find some business partners for you. Actually, your closing speaker today, our best speaker today, Remigillos, is going to be, well, your customer taking that side. But I want to understand a bit more on the supplier side. Today, you talked to us about challenges in lasers. So I'm going to ask you for your Santa Claus Christmas list item on an idea laser. And Francesca and I will find it for you. Dream away. What laser do you need? Okay, so I, I would say I would say the stability is the cause. Um, that, that's most important. If you can, if we can run laser and it, which is stable for for weeks, months, years, that 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 would be great. I mean, you allow me to dream, so that that's one. No, thing. I, I was going to get you an unstable laser, so don't worry. It's good that you told us you want a stable one. But uh, I believe that Marcus and you, Marcus for Laser Lines, should have a nice discussion after this. Uh, you have been working with many optics manufacturers, validating their optics. And today, Marcus from Presitech, two Marcus in the room, makes it difficult. Uh, he was talking about Chinese. Uh, companies, uh, people from Asia erupting this market. You are in a unique position of comparing the optics manufacturer in Asia with the optics manufacturer in Europe. And I don't want you to give me any stereotype. I want you to, I want to understand, can European 
customers be able to now differentiate in quality and make a, make educated choice by working with Lidaris? Um, that, that's an interesting question, but uh, I do believe, I mean, uh, what we are trying to see is a little bit of truth, right? What the element can withhold. You can run a blind test if you want, and you can compare optical elements completely independently. So I cannot you reveal any numbers for our customers that, that we uh, work this. That would be unethical from my side to say whether Europe. <laughs> no, I don't want you to say that. But I, I, want to be, I, I want to believe that all the potential clients that we have in the room, like companies like Convergent, like Placitech, like LaserLine, like GFH, where we have many, many more, like Trumpf, uh, let me keep reading at the participant list. So all these people, uh, when they have to choice the right laser optics, they can contact Lidaris and they can say, we purchased these samples from X, these samples from Y, and these samples from the great, uh, from the great Optoman and Edmund Optics. Uh, can, can we can we have have a comparison in terms of a specification, especially the LIDT? Oh, this, this of course, you, you can do. I mean, we can run a comparison for you. Um, and uh, yeah, and I believe that, 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 that would be a nice way to, to, to find the correct vendors. That's what, we, that's what we encourage here. I mean, you can just get the sample, uh, test everything, but you also have to check for repeatability. Because you have to remember, it's not uh, different batch of optics can be a little bit different because of the manufacturing defects and other manufacturing effects. Unfortunately, the laser induced dummy threshold test doesn't really allow to test all the samples. But I, I want to I want to go to Marcus from Presitec. Marcus, you joined this meeting and you are very interested about the laser optics world. I want to really understand a little bit when it comes to choosing the right suppliers of optics, uh, how, how do you do this from the point of view of Presitec? Is it, uh, do, do you have par partners who can test every optics that you receive? Uh, is it difficult sometimes to, to define what is really the ideal supplier? A good question. Um, so I'm, I'm not from the uh, supplies department at Presitech, and I sometimes struggle with my own de with supplies department as well, because uh, um, uh, uh, sometimes we need special uh, optics, special coatings, and uh, um, uh, we, we rely on uh, long-term relationships. And for example, 2.6 is one of our suppliers for, for, for decades right now. And uh, this is, this is a, a good partnership. And, uh, and we, we do have, uh, for, with respect to coatings, very good partnerships in Germany as well. Um, and for sure, we try to do everything in-house as laser line also. We, we do have the machines. We, we, we buy the lasers with the high powers to, to test the optical components inside the housing. So this is important. We do not do the tests of the optical components outside. Um, uh, at that point, we trust our suppliers that they uh, um, do coatings, uh, or based on our specifications. We do some internal checks, when uh, quality checks when they come in, but typically um, it's all uh, um, put together and then uh, we, we do our tests on, on cutting, uh, pressure tests, um, long-term stability tests with respect to focal shift and all that stuff. Presitec is, is a market leader on laser heads. Uh, 26 is a great company, a huge company. I hope they can introduce you to more, more suppliers, and I think it will be really fantastic for many of the companies. But I want to talk now quickly about the ultra fast sector. Uh, when one of the demands that we see, always see for, for optics is the need for high fluence to actually have very high power into a small, a small section of uh, area with the ultra fast uh, lasers. I have one of the companies who may be very excited about this in the room, all the way from Warsaw, Darius from Fluence is in the room. Darius, I want to make sure that you get the right laser optics after this meeting. Give me one challenge all the way from Warsaw. Uh, so thank you very much, Jose. It's very nice to, to be here. And uh, well, it was very nice uh, uh, show today to, to see what, what people have and what they need. So something I, I can tell what our customers need, because this is very important for us, right? So uh, you can imagine we have femtosecond laser that's for micro machining. So very precise, uh, uh, things that our customers are doing. 
and what what they would appreciate a lot if we have like a nice optics for high power ultra fast lasers that's working on you know all the wavelengths that we use so for example 10 30 nanometers 515 nanometers 343 nanometers and uv 258 nanometers you know this this is uh, i think a challenge right thank you Pasha, darius because you made the perfect introduction to the next speaker today. Remy Guillos, the CEO of Optoman, one of the beautiful success stories we have in manufacturing high-end IBS coated optics. Remy Guillos, the floor and the attention of everyone. Thank you for closing this fantastic meeting. Goes to you. All right. Uh, good afternoon. I am Remy Guillos from Optoman. Uh, yeah, so thanks a lot for Jose and Francesca for this meeting. Actually, I think that we talk about laser optics and coatings and all that stuff a little bit too little. Uh, so uh, today I will cover this very specific topic about um, uh, degradation and damage threshold of HR coatings uh, for 10, 30 nanometers. Dadush, I will cover other wavelengths with different uh, presentations, if you don't mind. So today let's concentrate on this, 10, 30 in femtosecond, picosecond regime. Uh, but uh, before moving to all the uh, specifics, uh, let numbers and graphs, let me introduce briefly up to man to those who don't know us yet, at least. Uh, this uh, fairly new company uh, was established back in 2017. And from the very beginning, actually, our mission was to be your sidekick for laser optics development. Uh, this means that we design, develop, and manufacture highly customized and application optimized laser optics. Uh, however, our core competences are production of coatings and optics actually for extreme and ultra fast laser systems. Uh, yeah, and uh, basically we do that uh, uh, with a single coating technology, which is ion beam sputtering. Now, in my opinion, a very powerful tool for this very purpose. Okay, uh, so before going, uh, moving ahead, let's say with challenges for laser optics and makers for laser systems as well, I would like to use a statement from Uncle Ben. I'm not sure if all of you know who is Uncle Ben. He's an uncle of Spider-Man, actually. And uh, once he said that with a great power comes great responsibility. If we talk about lasers, I would go for a little bit different, let's say, statement that with a great laser power comes uh, great resp responsibility for coaters. And uh, that, is, that is basically true. Uh, because, you know, optics and uh, especially coatings uh, is the very weakest link of the laser systems, I, I would assume, yeah? Okay, so now let's, let's assume that we have very big and scary uh, 10, 30 nanometers, 10 to second laser. So I'm following up for what um, uh, Gimtadis said. And uh, I don't know, let's, let's take a number which is about one kilowatt of average power. Uh, so after some time with a big number of pulses, we'll be seeing a color change on the surface. Uh, and that thing is co uh, considered as a damage. So no wonder is that laser engineers most likely will be replacing such components, yeah, such mirrors. Uh, so uh, how do we get rid of this? Yeah. Um, how do we get rid of this? We just, uh, I will not be covering all the mechanics of the degradation. I'll, I'll let me just go straight to the numbers. Here we have a two uh, graphs, blue curve, red curve. Blue curve is a catastrophic damage. Red curve is a degradation, actually a color change. Yeah. Uh, so we see that a catastrophic damage is rather stable with a different number of pulses. Uh, so that's kind of not, not a big problem here. Uh, but uh, uh, obviously we have to get rid of this uh, uh, ugly red tail. Um, and uh, yeah, so how do we do that? What's, what's next there? Uh, so we just, do a little bit of a brutal research and development. First, we run a bunch of uh, trial coding runs of different coding designs and arrange kind of a private LIDT competition. Uh, after that, uh, after that, uh, let's make an assumption that uh, absorption is responsible for, uh, for the damage threshold. So let's try to reduce that number down to one ppm at 1064. Uh, actually, it's not a big, uh, big thing here because uh, the record low value at 1064 is 0 0.12 ppm. Uh, and, uh, and next, some other stuff follows. Uh, let's say some 
post-coding treatment uh, uh, things, which I would like to keep uh, uh, confidential for myself at this very moment for intrigue uh, for the next uh, presentations. Yeah. Okay, so uh, after that, after all these stages, we have to do a little bit of optimization. Uh, uh, here in the round number one, we see that uh, we still uh, have a gap between catastrophic damage uh, threshold and uh, color change. Uh, and this is not acceptable. Uh, next, we move with a round number two. This looks way more promising uh, because the gap between uh, red and blue curves is much lower. Uh, but still, this, uh, this, uh, these results are not, uh, uh, let's say, acceptable due uh, to the fact that damage threshold, catastrophic damage threshold dropped uh, much uh, lower than it was initially. And uh, with a third round, we have a bullseye here because we have a respectable damage threshold value, which is close to one joule in centimeter square. And we did not observe any color change, any degradation. Uh, and uh, this design is uh, repeatable, which looks uh, a solid solution already. Uh, we simply have a catastrophic damage where it is supposed to be. All right, so uh, we also uh, repeated all the experiments with uh, 10 picosecond regime because the picosecond lasers are becoming trendy in, in industrial applications, yeah. Uh, so we did not observe any kind of a color change on any samples uh, which uh, were uh, manufactured. Here we had to follow a different approach and chase for the record high LIDT, uh, uh, let's say numbers. And uh, yeah, this is what we have, um, something like uh, uh, 3.5 joule in centimeter square for a P-polarized light and above five joule in square centimeter for S-polarized light, uh, yeah. And that is pretty much it. Let's go to the epic and already legendary questions. Uh, what can you do for us? Uh, so first of all, we did a lot of experiments, a lot of trial batches and everything. We see those numbers. So we see an improvement of, let's say, our optics, our designs. But we need to get a, a complete understanding how these results can be perceived in the market. Is this good? Is this bad? Is this normal? And uh, definitely it would be, uh, I would be very happy to qualify or it's also okay to disqualify those uh, samples in the real working uh, high power laser systems, maybe with a larger area testing. And uh, what we can do for you, it's rather simple. We can do for you uh, exactly the same thing we have been doing for you from the very beginning uh, to be your sidekick for laser optics development. That Thank is you very, very fantastic. Much. I, I had never met, look, we talked to all the CEOs of Epic. I had never met a person who, with the strongest push, a stronger push to go all around the world. And we met in very different parts of the world, you and me, all around the world, talking about the needs of the customers. Congratulations on the amazing job, amazing job that you have been doing. I want to talk to you, some of your current and future customers. I don't want to reveal who they are, if they are current or future, but I want to see if there are some remarks they have with all the things things that we have now in the, in, we don't know how in the room. Tamo from Laser Centrum Hanover. We have discussed a lot about laser induced damage threshold in this meeting. We have discussed a lot about different laser coatings in this meeting. We just got the presentation from Remy Gigius. Tell me about what's on your mind and what kind of room for cooperation can we start after this? Um, yeah, thanks. Um, I think it was a pretty good meeting here. Uh, we had a lot of uh, Great topics um, for us. It's always um, always very good to kind of get to know the the challenges that um, everybody is facing with uh, with optics and with thin films. And we're always interested in learning, you know, what um, what's going on here. Um, very. Can we the test the very some first... of the? Let me ask directly because I love doing that. Can we test some of the Optoman optics, some of the coatings into some of the demonstrators of Laser Centrum Hanover? I pay for the shipping expenses. Um, yeah, I think so. We uh, we can probably test uh, some of them. Um, actually, from the from the laser damage um, topics that we had here, right from the very first um, presentation, it was all about CV LIDT. Um, you know, these are already topics that we are also working on right now, the, the missing standards. Um, and it always comes up with all of these optics, right? It's always the, the topic, uh, LIDT questions. 
I go from Hanover, Revigius, to another potential customer of yours, or maybe current. I go from Hanover to the capital of optics in Europe, Jena. And we go to Jena Optic, Nico Baumbach. Thank you very much for joining the meeting today. We just saw the presentation from Optoman and a lot of presentations about helping the companies with the, the optics with the right laser induced damage threshold. Uh, what's on your mind now? Or what kind of room for cooperation can we start after this? Thank you, Marseille. So also from my side, it was a very great meeting today. So, but what, what I took away again is that we really needed like a, a tripod that we need all the application specialists talking with the laser manufacturers, talking to the, to the optics manufacturers also to have a very close collaboration to get a heads up to really develop all the parts which are necessary for future applications. So especially when I saw the last presentation from Optoman where they're going to very high LIDTs and we also need the other people involved to get a clear picture of what's going to happen next. And as we know, there are markets which are very fast paced. So every information that is provided in advance can help us to, to keep up the pace. And this is very important. And this is what I see what happens here right now. Thank you so much, Nico. And you have to, you have to come to our laser micromachining event on the 17th of May. There is for the end users. Today was optics and coatings. But of course, yeah. we will always bring those people on the on the table. I want to also address this now with, with Marcus Rutering. Marcus, you were the opening speaker. Send us away the way that we deserve. We just saw the presentation from Ottoman. I'm particularly excited about this company myself. My heart is, is not Switzerland. My heart has sides and is on the side of Ottoman. What can we do here to, to help companies like Ottoman? And what kind of challenges could you share with them? Yeah, uh, thanks, thanks for your question, Jose. I mean, um, you know, when, when I speak and think about optics, I think about processing optics and maybe if it's okay for you i want to share another picture of oh, laser line can share anything they want today this is processing optics in real life yeah <laughs> this optic was used in a laser welding surrounding for something like five thousand hours and um, this is how it comes out afterwards and uh, I remember very well the, the, uh, the comment from 2.6 about lifetime and how, how long it does take to readjust the optics, to recalibrate the optics and something like this. Our customers using these optics in 5,000 hours, one year production, don't allow us to touch the optics for recalibration or something like this. Yeah. So when we got this optic back for inspection and we opened it up and we looked into it, all the glassware was fine. Everything was perfect. The, the optic was welding nicely. And this is one of our challenges. I mean, the laser induced thermal threshold and all, all of these coatings and stuff is very important. But you know, if you, if you transfer uh, the, the, the whole thing from the laser theories over coatings, over materials, uh, fused silica or sapphire, which coating can you use, et cetera, in the end of the day, we all have to supply processing optics to customers to do a job with it. And this is something we should never forget about. Yeah. Um, so I don't want to make a discussion too theoretical. We have to process parts. And this is something that's important. Yeah. And don't forget about that. This is the real life if we go to the shop floor and we are working on stuff. Uh, specifically high power CW might be different with some, some other fast bases, but never forget in any discussion in the end, the customer must pay for what we do with the products that he manufactures and all of us can buy back either as if it's computers or cars or whatever. So theoretically we can just discuss a lot, never forget real life. That's maybe the possible message I want to leave here at the end. Thanks. That's a fantastic message. Uh, Remy Gidius, would you like you. to comment to give me a final counter remark of that one? Uh, yes, actually, I've also seen such kind of a dirty stuff in uh, real factories. <clears throat> that is why uh, we decided to do cavity optics, uh, <laughs> uh, where optics are sitting in a very clean environment and uh, just work fine for, let's say, many years, suppose, supposedly. <laughs> uh, yes, I, I, I totally agree that we have to think about a total cost of ownership of, from the perspective of the end user. That was what Kyle was addressing. And uh, I'm a fan of this idea from the very beginning. So yeah, 
you do, you, you know what I'm a fan of? I'm a fan of you. And it's five, <laughs> eight minutes past five. So I have to say that it was a great meeting. We talked, a lot of opportunities were scouted. We talked with Laser Line, we talked to Convergent about different challenges on the high power, 45 kilowatt plus. They are looking for optics there. On the blue laser, two to five kilowatts. They are looking for optics there. We think about sapphire optics, about being one of the solutions, but we are not sure. They are looking for large spots in the, in the hybrid infrared and blue laser, large spots there. Actually, Color has spotted a very clear room for cooperation. And both Optima and High Laser and all the LIDT uh, optics, so high LIDT optics, they are looking for new lasers. I want to explore this a bit, but we are going to have a dedicated meeting for that. But already Optima and High Laser said we want a 1053 and 1064 nanometer laser for a coating activities. What I would like to say is that even though you think the meeting is over and now you can worry about something else, you're wrong. The meeting starts now. Now it is the time to do the follow-up. You want to get in touch with any of the participants today. All you have to do is send me an email, jose.pozo.epic-asso.com, and I will introduce you to any of the participants that were in the meeting today as soon as you tell me that there is a clear room for cooperation. It is not a sales association. It is a technology co-development association. And you guys, you guys make it what it is epic. Again, I'm talking on behalf of a fantastic team of experts who form the EPIC, the European Photonic Industry Consortium. The topics for the online meetings from now all the way to summer are announced. Register as soon as possible. Do not wait for my invitation. There is no need to wait for that. You already had the agenda. As soon as you can, register. And all I want to ask you before I go away, all I want to ask you is wash your hands, wear a mask, Keep some social distancing. Get vaccinated, even with AstraZeneca, because I can't wait to start traveling again. Take care. Bye-bye.